What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and this is another episode of The Best List in Warhammer 40K. Today, we're talking about the weekend of August 5th and 6th, 2023, and we have some spicy lists coming out of the woodwork. As always, if you enjoy my Warhammer 40K content, remember to drop a like on the video, subscribe on the channel, all the YouTube things, and let's dive into some competitive Warhammer 40K lists that went undefeated this weekend. As always, what I'm gonna be doing is picking out a list that went undefeated or close to it for each faction that is doing well so far. Now, I'm not gonna be going through every single undefeated list. If you want a deeper dive into undefeated and top lists for a variety of factions, come check me out on my YouTube show. We go live at 4 p.m. USC. Eastern time every single Tuesday for Tactical Tuesday, and uh, if we'll do a deeper dive over there. But if there are factions that have repeat undefeated players, I'm going to be talking about them, but I'm not necessarily going to be going over every single list available. This week, Eldari has continued to reign supreme with some absolutely ridiculously strong showings in the largest events of the weekend. However, Gene Steeler Cults is nipping at their heels and closing the gap between them with actually a very high win rate and a high rate of 5 and O's, but largely at smaller events. Gene Steeler Cults specifically went undefeated at the Capital Clash Wars on the Shore GT Bed Burger Schoenen Kroppen War in the Fort and Midgard GTs. Now these were all smaller events between 25 and 40 players, so in that five round GT scale, whereas Eldari did better on the larger super major scale. The event we're gonna be talking about today is the Wars in the Shore GT. This was a 38 player, five round GT held in Erie, Pennsylvania. This one was won by Travis King, who had an absolutely ridiculous showing, dropping only nine points over the course of three games. So scoring three 100 points victories, as well as a 94 and a 97. The list in particular is largely what we would expect to see out of Gene Stiller Cult at this phage, very character focused, running a biophagus with extrudable cunning. This guy is being attached to a large unit of 10 aberrants to give them forward deploy, put pressure on their opponent, and largely destroy their screens to allow easy deep striking on round two plus. We then have one Clamavis. This guy is able to project an Omni Scrambler aura to protect cult ambush markers being placed in the back of the Gene Stiller Cult formation and stop enemy deep strikers from messing with them. This is particularly good in the mirror match or against some armies like Space Marines who can use Inceptors. Chaos Demons and Grey Knights also have similar effects where they can jump around the table three inches away from enemies and destroy cult ambush tokens by teleporting next to them. And the Clamavis just stops that dead in its tracks. We also have two Nexoses, three Primus, two Reductus Saboteurs, one of them with Meticulous Planar, two CP Tax, one of your opponent's stratagems. Running two units of Acolyte Hybrids packed with Demolition Charge the ridiculously powerful one-shot weapons. Closing out the list, we have the normal allocation of Neophyte Hybrids. That's four units of 20 with grenade launchers and seismic cannons. We then have the Aberrants that I mentioned before and two Achilles Ridge Runners to provide additional AP to the shooting units with Crossfire. Now the event rules cutoff for this GT was July 23rd, which was a couple days before the erratas to Gene Sailor Cults. A bunch of things changed in that errata, including am Cult Ambush being more difficult to uh, use with the units having to be wholly next to their marker rather than being able to string across the table. However, those demolition charges did get the ability to th be thrown again after the unit respawned. So you win some, you lost some in the transition. I do think Gene Star Calls generally are going to be un uh, depowered by that change pretty significantly, although they are still strong and I think we probably still would have seen a 5-0 and finish from them. I don't think we would have seen quite the same scores that we did with only dropping nine points over the weekend. Now again, Gene Star Calls had an absolutely ridiculous showing this week with just a massive number of smaller five-round events being won by Gene Steeler Cults. So they definitely are still showing their teeth, although I don't know how many of those used last week's errata that could have changed their win rate potentially. Moving on, we have Eldari. It's no surprise that these guys are at the top. They have been basically the undisputed masters of Warhammer 40k 10th edition since its release, and we're hoping to see some changes to them in the future to knock them down a little bit. That said, they didn't get as many event wins as Gene Steeler Cults this week, only going undefeated at the Leeds Super Major and the Battle to End Alzheimer's GT. However, that lead Super Major was a 202 player, seven round GT. And we saw Eldar take the top one, two, and three spots. So certainly still showing their teeth and their absolute dominating power as the powerhouse of the metagame right now. Now we already talked about a very 
very strong score from Gene Steeler Calls in the last entry. What we're going to be talking about today for the lead Super Major is a ridiculous finish for Josh Roberts, who somehow managed to drop a grand total of two victory points over seven games. This is probably one of the most insane final positions I've ever seen for a 40k list. Dropping two VPs over seven games is absolutely nuts. Josh's list is a pretty spicy one, focusing on incredibly heavy monsters and big walkers. We have an Outrock Wayleaper as the Warlord to generate CP, a Farseer to manipulate Fate Dies and add a fortune to the big heavy monsters, a Farseer Skyrunner to grant rerolls. This guy does have the Phoenix Gem as well. Important to note, both those Farseers will not work together on their Fate Dice manipulation. They will allow you to project two auras of the ability to manip manipulate Fate Dice, but you can only use the, their ability to turn a die into a six once per turn, regardless of the number of Farseers you have. Having multiple does sort of depreciate their power a little bit, but it does allow you to get access to their unique psychic powers. So we both have minus one to be wounded from Fortune and reroll hits from Guidance. We then have both varieties of Avatar, both the Avatar of Kane, the absolute powerhouse foot walking monstrosity. This guy is incredible in Eldar for his ability to not only fake dice long charges, but also rapid ingress and phantasm to get around the table. He's difficult to kill, so a couple shots won't knock him out. Your opponent really has to commit enormous amounts of firepower to kill this dude, and he hits like an absolute truck in melee. We also have that backed up with the Incarn, so the ability to teleport around the table, hold on to objectives even when your units are destroyed on them, or act as an offensive piece by just destroying a unit, teleporting the Incarn to the location of its death, and then using the Incarn to shoot and charge afterwards. We have three units of Shadow Spectres, mostly to act as utility units, to drop down on the table, move around, and score tactical missions, and two Wraith Knights, both of them with two heavy Wraith Cannons. This list uh, is kind of spicy, but obviously undeniably effective. At the end of the day, the scores at the Leeds Super Major were absolutely nuts, but having those scores achieved by a list that was focused on four giant super heavy monsters and vehicle walkers is pretty cool. Aspect Warrior artillery spam of some other Eldar lists where they're trying to play a super fast and uninteractable game plan. Instead, we're basically just putting a ton of super heavy beef on the table using Eldar's movement shenanigans to protect it and get it up the, the table, shoot you to death with Wraith Knights before closing the game out with those two avatars. And that is pretty sweet. Now, before we move off the lead Super Major, I want to talk about another faction that actually didn't have any undefeated records this week, but a ton of X and Ones. Space Marines are making their mark known on the 40k metagame, and namely with the Death Watch Black Spear Task Force Detachment. This detachment gives a Space Marine army unparalleled maneuverability. They're able to use the Teleportarium Stratagem to pick their models up off the table and teleport them around the table. And on top of that, they also retain a lot of the effectiveness of the Gladius Task Force. Obviously, the army is still able to use Oz of Moment. They get double Oz of Moment once per game from the Tome of the Ectoclades, and they can use their own version of Adaptive Tactics to mesh alongside their own version of Combat Doctrines to add things like sustain hits or lethal hits to large units like Desolators or Aggressors. This list in particular was running a Captain with the Thief of Secrets Relic Enhancement Weapon, a Watchmaster with the Tome of the Ectoclades. That's back up three units of Death Watch veterans. We are running four frag cannons and four Death Watch Thunderhammers, making the units both good at shooting and fighting. They're able to put out a ton of damage at range, teleporting around the table to get lines of sight with the Thunderhammers, then back that up with really, really strong melee as well. Moving on, we have the ever-present Desolation Squad of 10 Super Crack Rocket Launcher Equipped Marines. These guys are both good at indirect fire, being able to fight Venger Launchers and Castle Launchers to clear infantry before following that up by blowing stuff up with the D6 plus one damage super crack rocket launchers in the late game when they need to. We have an Inceptor Squad for its utility on secondary missions and deep striking basically wherever it wants. An Infiltrator Squad, one Land Speeder. This guy can buff the blast weapons on the Desolator Squad alongside a Repulsor and a Proteus Kill Team. Proteus Kill Team is the firstborn Marine kill team unit. These guys are able to take an absolutely ridiculous array of special weapons. And this one is rocking four frag cannons and four Terminators mounted with three Cyclone missile launchers. This gives them unparalleled firepower in an infantry unit. Pretty strong melee to back it up with a mix of close combat weapons, death watch, thunder hammers, and power fists. And with the teleportarium able to teleport them around the table, they're able to leverage that firepower from basically anywhere on the table that they need to. Death Watch are good in a variety of matchups and have ridiculous flexibility and are definitely proving themselves probably more effective than the classic Gladius Task Force and certainly bearing the banner for the entirety of the Space Marine faction right now. Despite not having any undefeated record, 
Records, Death Watch actually had one of the highest win percentages of the weekend and had an absolute smorgasbord of X and 1 finishes at a wide variety of events, including, of course, the lead Super Major. Now that moves us on to the less successful factions. We did have a couple factions with a single undefeated list, and we're starting with, of course, my favorite faction and the faction uh, to which this channel has a ridiculous bias, that being Tyranids. At the North Star Open, a 38-player five-round GT, we saw Chase Garber go 5-0 with a wild Tyranids list. Tyranids have shown a lot of build flexibility, maybe more so than other factions, which is kind of I guess thematically appropriate for Tyranids, but they're able to push either into big heavy monster builds or shooting heavy psychic builds or even large swarms of smaller bugs to just push your opponent off primary objectives. This list looked like it had some close games and is probably one of the most unique compositions for the faction that we've seen so far. This list is running a little bit of a combination with some very weird includes. It is led by a Neuro Tyrant instead of the classic Hive Tyrant that we see. This little guy is relatively cheap and able to put multiple models into Synapse range to be affected by Tyranid stratagems and buff their morale. He also imposes a minus one leadership penalty when you use your Shadow in the Warp. We have one unit of Gargoyles in the battle line slot alongside two units of five barb gaunts, two biovores to score secondary missions with their spore mine launchers, two exocrines, and two maliceptors. I think these guys are basically a pretty solid include. For the low cost of 600 points, you get two backline shooters that are relatively effective and tough to kill, and two absolutely indomitable frontline fighters. The maliceptors, while their damage output isn't extreme, they're incredibly difficult to kill, and if your opponent doesn't deal with them, they will start to impose hit and wound penalties on your opponent's army, and basically make the rest of your army also impossible to kill. Things get pretty wild in the bottom. We do have two units of six Zoanthropes and a unit of Venomthropes, which is to be expected. Zoanthropes are probably the most efficient damage output in the Tyranid Index, and Venomthropes can help protect them from return fire. However, we then have a Psychophage to grant a six plus Feel No Pain to everything around it, alongside three Molochs. This one's throwing me for a little bit of a loop. Molochs are a very weird profile. However, I do wonder if this is a little bit of a concession to trying to beat Gene Steeler Cult and other horde armies. Molochs are incredibly good at killing large numbers of infantry, given the fact that they have an anti-infantry devastating wounds. Maw attack, but that's multiple damage, and they attack 16 times in melee, other than that. On top of that, they also pulse mortal wounds within 12 inches to enemy units when they deep strike, which is a potential lot of damage, especially if you can hit lone operative characters with it to try to kill them with those mortal wounds. And you can potentially put multiple Molochs on the table to inflict those mortal wounds multiple times on a specific character to try to kill them. Part of this ability is that you still are restricted to deploying outside nine inches of enemy units, so the actual band at which you affect units is relatively slim, but Molochs are still a pretty good option to score secondaries. They're a big, relatively tough to kill monster that can rapid ingress on the table, do a little bit of damage, and then run over to score engage in all fronts or behind enemy lines, grab objectives, and just clear off enemy infantry. Clearly, it worked out for Chase because he was able to take that down that event with a 5-0 record. However, his game's looking incredibly tight. He didn't score extremely high wins, but he was able to get the W in all of his games. And that moves us on to the last event that we're going to discuss. However, with multiple armies being represented, the Boardroom Brawl. This was a 40-player GT, ran five rounds in British Columbia, and had an absolutely wild meta. We saw a very slim showing from Eldari and Gene Steeler Cult at this event, and it kind of displayed how interesting the competitive environment is without those factions being overrepresented. We had it won by David Burdett, playing thousands and Sons with Riley Carter as the second undefeated rocking Imperial Knights. David Burdett's Thousand Sons list consisted of an Exalted Sorcerer with the Umberlific Crystal, an Infernal Master with the Arcane Vortex to buff his psychic weapons, Aramon on a Disc of Zinch alongside a Thousand Sons Demon Prince to grant an Aura of Stealth and be the caddy for Lord of Forbidden Lore to allow him to enact Kabbalistic rituals multiple times after they've already been cast. We have Magnus the Red following things up, the mainstay of the Thousand Sons roster alongside two units of 10 rubric marines all of them with warp flamers and a smaller unit of rubric marines with its natural loadout of soul reaper cannons inferno bolt guns and their attached aspiring sorcerer we have one rhino that can hold one of those units of rubric marines the other one can go out of strategic reserve or just stand on the table if there's no indirect fire threatening it or simply have the exalted sorcerer attached to allow it to teleport around with umbralific crystal alongside a mutilith vortex beast to extend the range of cabalistic rituals we also have a unit of five scarab occult terminators two 
two Thousand Suns spawn, I think just to act as a little utility unit, as well as one unit of Thousand Suns cultists, a scouting forward operator that's going to be able to grab secondaries on turn one and can even generate CP when it dies. Now, following that up in second place, but also at an undefeated record, we had Riley Carter with his Imperial Knights. And this list is absolutely one after my own heart. It is just focused on the big stompy boys. We are rocking Canis Rex. It's been a while since we've seen this guy on the table since the nerfs to towering. His points value increased so much that a lot of times players would ax him for a warden or even spring a couple extra points to bring one of the big super heavy dominus classes however he is making a return in this list and fortunately for him is one of the most powerful probably single models especially in melee in the entirety of 40k he can do absolutely ludicrous damage especially once he's combined with free stratagems that he generates for himself including things like thunder stomp and tank shock we have a knight crusader with the mythic hero enhancement to allow him to use his plus one to hit bondsman ability multiple times each turn alongside a knight valiant with the revered knight enhancement this grants a leadership improving aura to the knight which allows him to keep himself and the armagers around his feet in the fight a little bit longer to, to ensure that you don't randomly lose those important objectives when it's not convenient for you. We're also then running a single Armager Helvrin and two Armager Warglaves in the battle line. That gives the army a little bit of a faster element and allows the Knight Crusader an outlet for his Bondsman ability. Pretty interesting Imperial Knights list. Definitely not what I would have expected to see out of an undefeated Knights list, but certainly a cool one anyway. And with that, those are the best lists in 40k for this week. Let me know down in the comment section which one is your favorite. And if you've seen any other cool lists, do well in competition recently. Bit of a whoopsies, I forgot to record on my video for most of it, but you haven't hit the end here, so that's nice. Big thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. Thanks as well to everybody who supports the channel, either over on Patreon at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise, YouTube channel members, and Twitch subscribers. All you people are great and I love you. Everybody keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming.